Hey, beautiful people. This is Alexis Fernandez, the host of the podcast, Do You Fucking Mind? A podcast that teaches mindset hacks backed by neuroscience. This podcast gives you the tools you need to set boundaries, not take shit from anyone, to increase self-love, confidence, and even move on from an ex. I'm also going to teach you how to rewrite hardwired negative self-beliefs. And if you like going deeper into science, I even delve into what effects drugs and neurotransmitters have on your brain. So if you're okay with getting a little bit of tough love and the occasional swear word peppered in there, then this podcast is for you. Join me at the Do You Fucking Mind podcast, mindset hacks for a badass life. Hey everyone, today's guest and co-host is the brilliant David Duchovny, who is even cooler than I imagined. David and I just finished a movie together, so we start out reminiscing, then quickly get into his love of music, his writing, deal breakers, what defines a good kiss, and a lot more. Our first call today is with Savannah, whose recent relationships have affected her self-esteem, causing her to rethink her dating strategy. Next, we talk with Melissa, whose wedding plans have upset a close friend, leading to Melissa's own unhappiness. As always, thank you for listening. If you have a question and would like to talk with us, please reach out. Just look for the link at unqualified.com. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. David. Hi, Anna. How have you been? Where are you? I'm at home. I'm in a, did I show you pictures of my train car? I'm in my train car. If you can see like, but you can't really tell anything. Oh, it's beautiful. But uh, it was a train car on my property when I bought it and I wanted to redo the house. So I said, let's try and make the train car livable so I can live in there while the house gets done. So I lived in here for like a year and a half. It's a great plan B for like an Airbnb. It is, it is, right. Yeah, I can make a little money on it. For our listeners, David and I just worked on a project together called The Estate about a group of cousins that's fighting for a dying aunt's inheritance. Our director, Dean Craig, wrote this incredibly funny script and David plays our pervy cousin, Richard. You made that character such a delight in such an unexpected way. You know, when I got the script, I thought it was so funny, but I thought Richard was kind of like, he was a little light. I said to him, I don't know that I can do what I want to do with what's here. I just feel like I need a little more. And so he very kindly wrote two other long scenes. This guy, he's a bit of a creep, this guy, Richard, and he's kind of shameless which I was interested in playing that kind of shamelessness. I think it's such a, you know, I'm not shameless in life, you know, so, but I'm always, I I see some people who are able to move around seemingly without shame and I'm always fascinated by them. So that was something I wanted to be able to try to do. I wanted this guy really to feel like he had a shot. Your character, Richard, sort of advocates for open-mindedness in terms of (laughs) familial relations. Yes, he wants to be with his cousin, played by Tony Collette. And and part of it is so that they can get all the money for themselves in case there's a split. And part of it is that he just seems to really be into her. And the, the fact that they're cousins doesn't doesn't seem to to bother him at all. It's funny, Anna, you know, like every time you do a part, you realize that person thinks the movie's about him. You know what I mean? He, no matter where he is in the movie or how big the role is, it could be one scene you need to honor that as if like, yeah, he thinks he's got a shot. He thinks this is his movie. He thinks all these things. But it's that kind of swagger that I admired so much that right. I wanted to adopt. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I think the key for me as an actor has always been, first of all, be not judgmental about the person that you're playing, you know, not bringing to bear your own personal morality on that person, because that person obviously is living the way they want to live, you know, and then. The second part is like, you know, we're all stars in our own movie, no matter how big the parts. I don't want to be the asshole that says like, you know, raise the stakes or whatever, but it's like, that's his life. Those are his concerns, you know, and it's funnier if you commit to them. David. Yes. What intimidates you? I would say just like natural musical talent, you know. (laughs) Wait, elaborate on that. Just somebody who can just sing beautifully, somebody who has 
just has the music in them because I make music and, you know, for me, it's late in life doing it and I don't have perfect pitch voice or, and I'm not a musician in like the classic sense. So if I see somebody who just has that thing and I think it's mathematical, I think it's like a different kind of brain, you know, I'm just like, oh, they just have it. You're a man of many talents. You write, you sing, you act. Mm -hmm. Let's say as a society, those ideas were outlawed. Mm. How would you make a practical living? Wow, that's a hell of a question. That's very interesting. I think I'd probably teach. I was in graduate school and I like teaching. I like communicating. I guess that's part of acting. Uh, I think I would do that. I would live amongst the books, which would be nice. I would like that. You also strike me as the kind of person who could potentially sail around the world. Wow. I like to think of myself as that person, but I'm not really mechanical. I'm not a car guy. I'm not a machine guy. So the idea of sailing around the world, I think I could do it in terms of some of the physical hardship and some of the mental uh, loneliness. But the first thing that went wrong with that boat, I'd, I'd be a dead man. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't be able to fix it. What was your first boss like? I'm thinking of two people. One was a head lifeguard at uh, uh, an Ocean Beach Fire Island. And he was kind of strict. He was an authority figure. You know, he, we were a little afraid of him. I feel like I could still be a good lifeguard. Did you enjoy lifeguarding? Oh, yes. What did you love about it? Well, it paid $12 a day. Yeah. Which was the, the early 20th century. You know, this was a while ago before we had, I don't know what that is in today's dollars, millions. Uh, but I did get $12 a day, which at the age of 14, which is when I started, I just felt so independent. You know, I wanted to buy a stereo system, you know, so I, everything was like lining up. I have this job of making that money. I'm going to be able to buy that stereo system that's going to be able to enable me to tune out the fucking world because I have my, my power and my volume. Do you remember a song from that time? Oh, yeah. I used to come home and I would crank, and this, is, this sounds ridiculous, but I would crank an instrumental song by Chuck Mangione called Feels So Good. He plays it on the French horn, but it's, it's jazzy. It's like light jazz. And I don't know, it just, it just got me. It just soothed me that song. And I played a lot of Springsteen back then too. I'd play a lot of like uh, Darkness on the Edge of Town. And I'd take like a five, 10 minute cat nap after school, you know, but with the volume maximum, I can sleep anywhere, anytime. Ah, that is something that I really envy. But the boss, he was an authority figure. I mean, it is a job that has some pressures in it. You don't want anybody to drown. You really don't. <laughs> and the other first boss around that time was I also, in the springtime, I worked for a meat market in the village and I delivered meat to the good people of Greenwich Village. And my boss was a very mysterious French woman named Simone. Uh, Ooh. Who, yeah, exactly. And she would just, she had like a boy haircut, which was very, very infrequent back then. Like a yeah. Mia Farrow and Rosemary's Baby. She was just so French, which was mysterious and exotic. That was a great job too. Because I just hang out in the meat market until I had a delivery and, you know, then I go off. When you think of the idea of home, what does that mean to you? Oh, I think it's changed. I think it evolves. I think for the longest time it's meant when my two children are with me, wherever that might be. But they're almost adults now, so that's different. But physically, I guess New York is home, but I, I don't necessarily want to be there. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like New York is the home I was born into and L.A. is the home that I made. So it probably feels more like home here. I want to ask you about like some of the best and worst advice <laughs> you've received. Mm. I'm thinking of like my daughter has gotten two tattoos of things that I turned her on to. One of her tattoos is from a song I wrote called Stay on the Train. And it's stay on the train. The scenery will change. She had that tattoo. She got it. And for me, that was always just like parental advice. Just stay on the train, you know, it keeps moving. So you look out the window in an hour, it's going to be a different scene. And that's life. It also kind of indicates a comfortable idea of giving up control to a circumstance. Yeah. Or of just not attaching to the negative, not attaching to the present moment of, ah, it's so horrible. It's going to last forever. It's like when we're happy, we don't go, oh, it's so amazing. It's going to last forever. <laughs> when we're happy, we have the opposite. It's like, this is going to pass so quick. Why can't we have that approach to sadness? Oh, I feel terrible. Oh, it's going to pass so quick. Uh, <laughs> you know? 
it might as well. Uh, but I think, you know, for the most part in life, the sadnesses outweigh the glad. And that's just the way the game is set up. You know, we're born to lose. We keep losing things. We get older, we get older, we die. You know, we accrue things, but we also lose them. And eventually we lose everything. So that's the way the game is set up. David Duchovny delivers <laughs> optimistic messaging. <laughs> No, but I but I do think about the gift of age uh -huh. a bit. Thinking about heartbreak when you're 17 right. feels like raw, like the first time you skin your knee yeah. or something, like your nerves are young. Yeah. As you get older, it is a gift, whether by design or not. Sometimes I think of it as numbness a little bit. Well, you've seen that movie, right? You've seen the movie. You know, it played when you were 17. That was the first time you right. saw that, that heartbreak movie. And then you've seen it a couple times. And it always ends the same way. You go on, you live, and you fall in love again. And that's an amazing thing, because when you're young, you think, this is it. Yeah. I just think it's experience. And that's the other thing. It's like, if you're talking about inspirational teachings, you know, words can help, but it, like, it's ex experience is really the only teacher, right? I mean, you know that as an actor. Yeah. Were you ever given a discouraging moment by like a mentor or a teacher? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I told you, but when I tried out for the choir, and again, this is going to go into money because <laughs> that'll give you an insight where I was at when I was young. I was like, ah, I got to get money, money, if money was important. But in grade school, I went to Grace Church School in New York and they had a choir and they paid the choir. You know, not a lot, but they paid you a few bucks a month because you would have to come in on Sundays and sing in the church or whatever. And not only that, but they, I don't know if you ever, you've probably never been paid by a church, but they cut you big checks. I mean, physically <laughs> big checks. It's very impressive. It's like a golf tournament. I've never received the big check. It's very impressive. Hard to cash in at the bank. Yeah, yeah. So I was taken with both the size of the checks and the fact that I'd be getting a little money. And, and my friend said, oh, nobody gets rejected. Nobody, nobody, nobody. And so I auditioned in front of uh, the choir, which is what you have to do. And, and the, the choir master said, I'm going to play a note on the piano and I want you to sing the note after it. And I thought he meant the note after the note he was playing. I was too literal. So he'd go like, boom, and I go, boom. And whatever he would play, I was not singing. I wasn't trying to sing that. And I just remember the look of consternation on his face, on my friend's faces, and I got rejected. And uh, it was mortifying. I felt, you know, publicly shamed and and I'd never had a good singing voice. And that's why it's kind of amazing to me that I get to actually write songs and sing them now. Have you ever written a fan letter? No, but I did ask for some autographs when I was a kid of baseball players, and basketball players. I believe I got Willis Reed. Maybe I got Mickey Mantle, Dave DeBusher. You know, those were people I would have wanted autographs from. I didn't really you know actors. I, I didn't think about that. I never asked anybody in person. Those were, these were send away times, you know, like I was just a kid, I'd send away. And my dad had a running joke with me because I would send away for posters of my favorite teams or, you know, a little, a little ball in the team colors or whatever. And my dad just thought it was hysterical because I would never get what I asked for. Whatever I would send away for, if it was a poster, I'd get a keychain. If it was a ball, I'd get a poster. And he just, got such a big kick out of the fact that I never got what I wanted. <gasps> so, of course, you had to, like, strive for approval. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you collect now? I collect broken pieces of technology because they just break on me. They're, they're just gathering in drawers, phones, iPads. I break everything. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Do you have a favorite movie, like, on a rainy day? I mean, there are movies that I'll stumble upon, you know, not being able to sleep or whatever, or being on location and getting home at 2.30 and flipping on the TV because I can't go to bed yet. And I'll say, okay, I'll watch 10 minutes of this. And I can't, I watch the whole thing. You know, The Godfather or Casino or Boogie Nights is another one. Those are three great choices. Even if I start in the middle of any of them, I'm like, ah, I got to stay here for another hour and a half and watch this. Will you tell us about a formidable struggle, something that was in your youth that felt defining in some way? You know, divorce is a big deal, right? So my parents divorced when I was 11. It's like 1971. The 60s have happened, so it's a little more laid back. But still, divorce was a stigma. It felt like a secret. It felt like a failure somehow. 
on my part. I don't know why kids can feel that way. I didn't want anybody to come to my home. It was different. That sent me out into the world maybe a little earlier than I wanted to go. I ended up wanting to be out of the house a lot. I ended up not wanting to be there. So I was into sports, you know, I did my work. I have found reasons to be away. Yeah. If you could rank your triangle of film work, music, writing, in terms of personal satisfaction, what they give to you. Yeah, I don't know that I could rank them because one of the things that's so much fun for me about certainly music and somewhat with writing as well is that I'm new at it, you know, and I get to be 21 in my soul. I have this kind of curiosity and excitement about the whole thing and just wonder, wonder, oh my God, it's happening. I did it. Wow. I didn't know I could. I know I can act in a movie. I know I can act on a TV show. I've done that. It's better or it's worse. You know, it's fun or it's less fun, but I know that it can happen. I can't imagine the sense of like sort of cohesion if you have like your band behind you and everyone is like speaking this language. Right. Yeah. That feels very unknown to me. Yeah, it's, well, it's, un, it's unknown to me, you know? And that's the thing is like, sometimes I can't let myself get taken out of that moment. But if I did, I'd be like, the fuck are you doing up here? This was never supposed to be part of your life. You know, this was never even a pipe dream, you know? So it comes closer to gratitude with things like music and writing. And yet post-pandemic, I found a lot more gratitude acting. And maybe you can speak to that. Really? Yeah, it's Good. just like, wow, you know, I spent a year not doing it or almost two years not doing it. This is fun. I like doing this. And and also like my approach maybe changed a little bit. So like, here's a new approach and that feels new. Like if I put writing in there too, there's nothing like the autonomy of writing. Music for me, because I don't play well enough to record, and I don't play all the instruments like Stevie Wonder. I only play a little guitar. So I need, if I'm going to record or if I'm going to play, I can't do it without those guys. Obviously, movie making, same way. Can't just like put the camera on myself. But writing is just me, myself, and I, you know, and that's both scary, like it sounds, but also wonderful. The idea of a first sentence <laughs> yeah. is like incredibly intimidating. Yeah, it is. That's the, that's like the toughest part. And I don't sweat it. I'll just like, I'll start it and come what may, you know. There are certain humps in the writing process. Certainly the first sentence is one. For me, because I don't necessarily outline to like a real intricate degree, I'll have the broad outlines of the story that I'm getting at. But I don't even know, I'm not even sure of the tone when I'm starting, you know. I'm not even sure. So like, I don't even know the tone of that first sentence. Forget about the words. I'm like... I don't even know who's talking. You know, I don't even know if it's a narrator or if it's in this character's head. And so I just start and see how it feels. And then do you just simply sort of pull the threads and let maybe the surprise? Yes, definitely. There's this amazing thing that happens when you're writing where the characters start to talk to you, you know, and they don't say, you know, it sounds like a crazy person, but like, they'll say, I wouldn't do that. Or I want to go there. Let me go there. Let's see what happens over there. You know, or give me a fucking thing to say. You know, you're like not really treating me the way you should. You know, you think I'm a villain, but let right. me, let me. That must be so fun yes. to tap into that totally. realm of the imagination. My favorite part of the Truly Like Lightning, the last book that I wrote was I had a villain well, the villain in the story. And I'd written the book and it was over as far as I was concerned. And then I was on vacation and I just woke up one morning. I was like, he needs like a monologue, you know, basically. And I just started writing this thing. And it was so much fun to write because it was basically, it was the bad guy saying, you're wrong about me. You think I'm the bad guy. I'm the realistic guy. After you're done in 20 years, come back to me and you'll say you were right. I'm loving Miss Subways. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I also want to talk to you about The Bubble, which I, yeah. I've only seen the trailer for, yeah. which looks fucking awesome. It's very funny. Will you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, The Bubble is a Judd Apatow film where you have this huge movie franchise like a Fast and the Furious or Jurassic Park. And the pandemic has happened and these ah. actors in this franchise called Cliff Beasts have decided that they will brave illness to go back and grab some cash. 
And they don't necessarily like each other because they've been at it for too long and they're competitive and all the, you know, all the weirdnesses that actors get into. So we enter into a bubble, a quarantine bubble, and start to make the movie. And over the course of the film, we just grade on each other so much and also come to almost blows with the producers and the studio that we band together to escape from our own movie. What I think sets it apart for Judd Apatow, who directed, is that the footage of us in the franchise, in the Cliff Beast movie, which you see a bunch of because we're shooting it, it looks as good as any, you know, the funny part isn't like that sucks. The funny part is like that looks like it could be a real franchise. And I play an actor who, and I and I totally respect this guy because He's a total pain in the ass and he's a jerk, but he wants this movie to have an ecological point of view. Like the cliff beasts are dying because we've screwed the planet. He wants Right, you get to play like a yeah. yes. self-righteous character. I love it. Well, he he wants to make Don't Look Up, you know, not fast right. and furious, you know. Right. And so it's kind of a cool of the moment, you know, point of view where, yeah, why do we have to kill the dinosaurs? You know, like that's right. my thing too. It's like they're beautiful. You know, we're the problem. Man is the problem. You know, this kind of stuff. <gasps> that like taps into a sort of a youthfulness that actors can sometimes have that reminds me of like, you know, sophomore year in college. <laughs> well, for me, it's, for me, it's also like I've been that guy. I mean, certainly not as I hope not as big a pain in the ass as, as this guy is in the bubble. But certainly, you know, I've been involved in like big juggernaut type franchise things and i've said hey can we do a little better i know i know we're just entertaining i know it's entertainment but can we say something can we say something no you can't say something because that alienates you know this percent of whatever you know like that oh yeah yeah, yeah. it's uh like sort of the summation of my journey with the house bunny is it how so i think i was telling you this on set yeah. that i i wanted to know what happens when you've invested your 20s and maybe into your early 30s living in that world at the mansion. I wanted to play like a lower tier Playboy Bunny who gets essentially kicked out, has to move on. And she wasn't one of the ones that married somebody rich or whatever. Right. You know, she hasn't futurized. And to go back to her small town that was maybe religious and conservative and she maybe has a meth addiction and, <laughs> maybe. Um, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's not that I, I had a specific message. It was more of a personal idea, I guess, of sort of what happens with the next step that you haven't thought about when you're essentially in a glamorized but right. low pain career. That's what you've invested in. Anyway. Um, and then, then it became, you know, she becomes a house mom at a sorority. I hear what you're saying, which is you set out to make kind of a commentary on, I guess, commodifying your body and your looks without cashing in at that particular point and then maybe becoming too old to do that. Exactly. And have, too have... old. She wasn't quite hot enough. Right. It felt at that time, too, that my absorption of what I was witnessing in Los Angeles, too. Mm -hmm. I hear you. I hear you. Which felt like, you know, a lot of hustling, which is necessary, just a lot of salesmanship mm. and sort of what's the journey when that feels over. You don't strike me as a person that knows what happens at the Playboy Mansion. So there must have been a moment where you read something or you saw something or you heard about something. Yeah. Well, I had um, I had read some things and some friends had been there and they had some stories. And then I got to see it when we filmed there. The rooms were stories unto themselves. <laughs> Are you up for playing a game of deal breakers? Yeah. So for the sake of this, for the podcast, we're going to assume that you are on your first date. Okay. It's not It's not the first date of my life. It's the first date with this person. Yeah. Okay. On this first date, you find out that they believe the moon landing was a hoax. Yeah, it's a deal breaker. Right off the bat. Yeah, it's a deal breaker. Would you be inquisitive about it or would no. you kind of excuse yourself <laughs> i don't know i don't think i excuse myself i'm just gonna order another drink or two i think <laughs> right away <laughs> okay next date different this is a different person right yeah it's a different, different day yeah okay. yeah different day 
Um, they tell you that they were a contestant on The Bachelor. Oh, I'm like, tell me more. Yeah, sure. They made it to the fourth elimination. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, not a deal breaker. I'm, I'm good. Um, they talk trash about their ex. I don't mind that. You know, I don't like talking trash in general, but people get twisted up about exes, you know, so, yeah. All right. No. no. I think that's generous. Yeah. You notice that they agree with everything you say. Oh, I'm just thinking I'm, I'm like so self-centered. Maybe I wouldn't even notice that. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, that could be annoying. Yeah, that could be definitely annoying. I completely agree. Yeah. Um, every immediate member of their family is a convicted felon. <laughs> That's kind of sexy. Yeah? Yeah. What if they're a terrible kisser? Yeah, that is a deal breaker. Yeah? What does that mean? You asked the question. <laughs> I know, but it's kind of a tough thing to assess. Kissing is a conversation. It's using your tongue, but not with words. You are engaged in a give and take. And it's like kissing that somebody who's not listening. When you have an intimate scene, and I, because mm -hmm. I haven't had that many in the world of comedy, <laughs> how do you make your co star mm -hmm. comfortable? Well, now they have intimacy coaches, right? You know, in the last few years, I think ever since Me Too, movie sets have really tried to become very safe in that way for everyone involved. It's no longer like, say, when I did Californication, there were no intimacy coaches. But I would always say, if we're going to do a sex scene or a makeout scene, I would always go to the actress or actor or whatever. Because I had to kiss uh, Evan Handler once. So, so, so it's like, I would say, well, what are you comfortable with? You know, and we'll figure out what looks right. You know, obviously, real kissing looks like real kissing. It doesn't look sexy that often. You know, like what is real in life doesn't look great on camera all the time. But I would always just say, look, what are you comfortable with? What do you want to do? And we'll make it work, whatever you're comfortable with. It's not sexy. You know, I just think of it as another scene. I like that. I know that you are a man with an incredible vocabulary and a love of language. Mm. If you could take a pill and be able to know another language, mm. what would it be? I'd say uh, a Chinese dialect. You know, the Romance languages, I, I, Italian, French, Spanish, I hear them and there are familiarities to it, you know, even if I don't understand what's being said. But I listen to Russian or I listen to Chinese and I'm like, I have no clue. I have no zero. Like those sounds, I, I there's not one, I know zero. That would be an interesting box to open up. Totally. This is fun. Should we talk to some callers? Yeah. Let's talk to Savannah. Hi, Savannah. Hi. Hi, Savannah. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you so much for writing to us. David is here. He is Hi. rad. Savannah, will you tell us what's going on? Yeah. So my boyfriend and I broke up probably a few months ago now. We had been dating for about a year and it was a really mutual breakup. It really wasn't ugly or anything. But even before that, I was really in and out of relationships. I never was just single since practically like out of high school. I was just jumping around. From like long-term relationship to long-term relationships? Yes. Like at least like a year. Nothing that serious, um, but just, yeah, a lot of relationships. So now I'm really just trying to navigate being single and being okay on my own because I'm good when I'm with someone, but on my own, I feel really lost. In what way? I think I feel just kind of not validated, just insecure in a lot of aspects. So you have been dating a little bit? Yes. With dating apps? Yes, I have some apps, but I have a tendency to get really attached to people. And then when it just doesn't work out, that really puts me in a really low spot. Can you tell us about a recent episode or a date that was sort of emotionally unsatisfying? Yeah, 
I started talking to a guy through an app and we actually figured out that we knew each other back in college. We kind of had some mutual friends and we reconnected on an app. We're both kind of back in our hometown now. And we went out on a couple of dates, just hung out. We went to the movies, you know, we went out to eat and I could kind of sense he was pulling back. You know, I asked him like, hey, like, you know, do you want to do something else? You want to hang out? He just was kind of making excuses and stuff. And he did not flat out block me or anything, nothing ugly. But I know when to stop reaching out and when something is not, you know, going to go anywhere. But that put me in a really low spot. Because you probably had like a glimmer of hope with this, like, oh, okay, this uh, could be my next two-year relationship. Right. I mean, I say that, like, truly, I haven't been single, like, since I was 16 or something. And I've never really dated. And I could see myself as the kind of person that I would go out on dates and I would try to make this person, like, totally fall for me without even taking in who he was because I would want to be liked. I wonder, like in this year-long relationship that you guys just ended, it is interesting that it felt unemotional or not incredibly impactful to you. Were you in that for that long of a time because you, like me, just simply being in a relationship? Definitely. The last few months of the relationship, I knew it was over, but I just was still there and just holding on to it. And did you live together? No, we didn't. We go to different schools. So that kind of ended it. Um, I'm relocating to a different school and he's going even further. So we just knew it wasn't gonna, you know, last forever. (laughs) I, I relate to this, this idea of, you know, when you're single, not feeling your best self. And I think, you know, that was kind of the first thing you said about yourself. And and I think that's a real key for you to not figure that out because that's like a lifetime thing. Like we all, you know, we all want to feel whole on our own. It's a lifelong focus and a lifelong journey that way. But I think you're asking the right questions. I think you're right there. You know, you're right in the right place. And I don't know the answer, right? Like none of us know the answer, but I think you know that's the key. I think if you're asking those questions and you're in that place, then you're in a good place to actually meet somebody when you do. In some ways, it sounds like, you know, you want to find somebody so you can stop having to do that work. You know, like, uh, it would be nice if somebody else validated me instead of me, you know. And sure, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, that's wonderful when that can happen. But I think you're in a really good spot, even though it might not feel that way to you. I think that some of us, especially if you've gone from back-to-back relationships, we look at being single as almost being unemployed. (laughs) Yeah. And I really admire people who are very comfortable being single and look at it almost as freedom. And sometimes we talk to callers that feel a little overly picky because they want to defend their singleton, but the society is telling them, no, 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 you're supposed to be with somebody. And you're moving, did you say, Savannah? I have already moved. I'm getting ready to start law school. So I relocated and I start in the fall. Well, I validate you for that, smarty pants. <laughs> First, Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. How would it feel in your gut right now if David and I were like, you need to stay single for the next at least 10 months? Savannah, I would never say anything like that, by the way. That's all Anna. So. <laughs> no, it's like, it's like a gut check. <laughs> it definitely is something that my gut says that's what needs to happen. It's not necessarily what I want. It's not comfortable. But I think it needs to happen so that I can be good for the next relationship. Well, here's the deal. is like, Okay, Anna says that to you and you agree. That doesn't mean you can't be surprised. Wow, how great oh, would totally. that be? That'd be like totally. in, in two months, somebody shows up, you're like, oh, fuck that two months. <laughs> this, guy's, yeah. this guy's great and he really digs me. You know, so that's the good news is like, <laughs> yeah, you could say something like that and that would be a really good mindset to go forward with, but also go, oh, yeah, I'm open to surprise. Definitely. The large consensus, having talked to a lot of callers who do dating apps, 
it feels like 70% of the time, it just feels kind of bad. Yeah. Like my mom used to, she never let me look at women's magazines growing up, but I always had this feeling kind of like Instagram, maybe, where you just feel kind of bad and you don't know exactly yeah. why. So I do think that that is a part of this journey that with being able to have so many dates all the time, yeah, I think inevitably it's like everybody's looking for different things. Everyone's getting like their character on. It's probably really boring sometimes. It's probably tedious and a chore. And I just wonder if you just give yourself a minute to kind of have this time. I totally forget that that's the way people date now. I've never been on a dating app. When Savannah says dating, I think, like, that's a guy coming up to her somewhere and says, hey, I like you. Can I have your phone it number? It so doesn't work like that. You know, it's harder. It was harder back in the day to date. That's why I said open to surprise. But I guess with apps, there's no surprise. It's just like it's right there. It's always right there. I gave myself a challenge for a while in college, and then I did it later which was to compliment a stranger every day. And it wasn't for relationship purposes. It wasn't to be asked out or anything. It was just a small way to engage with my own uncomfortable social skills and to make someone feel good. I also did this weird thing where if a truck said, um, <laughs> like on the back of a truck, if it was like, you know, bad driver, whatever, call this number. I would call and say, <laughs> what a good driver, driver eight. Four, huh? three, nine, which the only delight there was me being proud of myself for being mm -hmm. weird, but also the person on the other line being like, what? <laughs> like never having heard of something like that. <laughs> but the idea of like just simple acts of social engagement, this is sort of a broad idea to Savannah because it's not, it's, it's just that everyone's down here on their phone all the time. Yeah. So, of course, we're dating like that. Have you started school yet? I'm starting law school in the fall, August. You're going to be close to a lot of new different people. I mean, it's like not going to be dating app. You're going to be meeting people. Yeah. You're going to have a hell of a lot of work to do as well. Not so much time to give of yourself to another person. So I think it's going to be a big change. You know, it's going to yeah. be a big change. Do you have a close group of friends? Not really at this point. <laughs> Savannah, I feel like we have a lot of things in common because <laughs> I would, in a relationship, I can be very neglectful towards, and I'm also, you know, a homebody anyway, but I wonder if it's actually kind of a good time to maybe nurture some friendships or some ideas in that world because I truly think the whole dating app situation of course, it's just going to feel bad and kind of drag you down a little bit. I also, and I've said this a lot, David, I've really noticed that after the quarantine, sort of after this experience where time melted and we were reflecting and we were anxious and bored at the same time and trying to figure out what our priorities are in life or whatever, that with this sort of emergence people are really putting a lot of pressure on themselves to get everything figured out. Mm. It's like a sudden wave that I really have noticed because it's just been an interesting idea talking to callers during that time that were going through a lot of reflection. Like, I hate my mom, is that okay? <laughs> to now, like, should I get married? <laughs> so just know, Savannah, you're not alone at all in sort of the pressure. And you're recovering from a rhythm even if it was an undramatic relationship that was maybe perfunctory, there was still a rhythm and a pattern to it. Yeah, I think you hit it on the head with the apps. It's just, it's not good right now. You know, I need to just focus on the new friends I'm going to meet organically. You know, it's... Totally. Yeah. yeah. Actually, totally. in person, you're going to meet people. Yeah. Yeah. I can't yeah. wait. I'm excited yeah, to get good. back in person. <laughs> do you think you could maybe plan a trip or do something exciting before you go through the like, intensity of law school? Yes. I actually, back when I was with my boyfriend, we did fly out and see one of my uh, old friends. And it was a really fun time. And I really enjoyed it. I would love to go back and see her, you know, on my own again. That would be yeah, really fun. Definitely. Yeah. Like take a road trip, take some time to yourself if you can afford yeah. to and do something that's a little bit out of your 
comfort zone that's not risking your precious ego, you know? Yeah. I mean, I could plan a backpacking trip around Italy for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also think uh, even if your last relationship didn't seem so intense, we've all been stuck with who we're with. He was the guy you were seeing. You know, there was way more focus than might have been five years yes. ago on that person. You're right. Even if it was an undramatic relationship, it was certainly concentrated. That, that was your human contact. Yes. That was your physical mm -hmm. contact for the past year. That's a lot. There's a lot going on there. So I give yourself a break on getting over it. Yes. Yeah. You know, take a little time. You've got till August. <laughs> yes. Like, to nurture yeah. some of your passions, some of the world that you weren't able to because of, you know, the fundamental compromise that we all bring to the table in a relationship. It's sort of yeah. exciting. I'm really, I am really excited. Yeah. Good. And it's nice <laughs> to like see you smile when you were talking about some of the dating stuff. You could feel the heaviness that it brings. This is the time of your life you're going to look back on and go, oh, why was I miserable? I was, should have been so happy. I had, I was free. I had no responsibility. I, ah, I blew it by moping around for that guy. Oh, yeah. Right. right. <laughs> I think this is a good plan, Savannah. Will you please be in touch? I want to know if we were helpful or not. Yes, of course. Thanks again so much, Savannah. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. David, I've totally noticed people fundamentally feeling lousy with dating apps. Yeah, it's so foreign to me. On the one hand, it seems like, oh, man, if I was 20, that would be glorious, right? On the other hand, in actual practical operation, it's probably not. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity, but most of it just sounds like it feels awful. Um, okay, well, let's talk with Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi. Hello. You're here with David Duchovny, who Hi. is just awesome. I know he is. <laughs> That's oh, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your letter. Will you tell us all what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I'm getting married next year. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, it's actually my and my fiance's second wedding. So um, we're doing things kind of traditionally, but um, very different from the first time. I had a very, very small wedding. Um, I had maybe five friends that I included. Uh, two of them were family. <laughs> so it was very small. Um, this time when actually when Matt proposed, he said, we're going to have an actual wedding. And I never thought of myself having an actual wedding <laughs> before. So it's a very special time and exciting, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it and trying to make the best choices. A big party right now feels right. We need it. <laughs> we want to celebrate, and we want everyone to have a great time, and you know, not just for us, but um, yeah, it, it, that's absolutely something that we've been thinking about. Is we want everyone to just have a big party and have something to celebrate. So I don't see I don't see a problem. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I, uh, I've been trying not to have a problem, but what one has come up. <laughs> so my bridal party, you know, that's a very difficult decision to make for anyone. And I went through, you know, a lot of conversations with my fiance and kind of talking about what we wanted to do. And um, what I opted to do was ask my childhood friends to be a part of it. And they are actually the reason I met him because when I was leaving my last relationship with an alcoholic and I was really struggling with that and I went to see my friends in, in New Jersey and I explained that to them because um, nobody knew what I was dealing with for three years. And I said, this is what's happening. I'm leaving. I'm getting back out on my own. I have to, I have to start over. And um one of my childhood friends put me on Bumble on a dating app, which is totally not my thing. Um, but she did. And I was on it for 12 hours and met Matt. And I wow. was scared of the app and got off. And uh, he and I stayed in touch. 
And uh, although he thought that I was pushing him away, um, it, it was probably the best thing for us. We both got off the apps and never That's looked back. Amazing. <laughs> so. We were just talking about how dating apps are so discouraging, but here you are. Yeah. Yeah. And how awesome that you kind of share that with your childhood friends. I still, I still don't see a problem. <laughs> okay. I'm getting there. <laughs> Um, so my problem is I did move away from New Jersey when I was young, uh, younger, and then, um, my late teens, college years, so on and so forth. I've been in uh, Pennsylvania and, um, I have a, a big variety of friends from different groups. And one of my closest friends, when I moved here, I was in her wedding recently and she was one of my few attendees at my first wedding I was really nervous to tell her I didn't ask her to be in my wedding party this time. I, I didn't want to hurt her. And that was the last thing I wanted to do. And, and she was going through a lot of personal challenges with family and um, pets and just all kinds of things. But this, I knew this was just going to be more bad news, even though I didn't want it to feel like bad news. So um, when I told her, she reacted in the way I expected. It was a big blow. And the first response back was basically, well, whatever, it's your, it's, it's your wedding, do what you want. <laughs> and I was like, okay, so I guess you're hurt. And she took it as, you know, she didn't make the cut. Um, <sighs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I can go on with, <laughs> with some of it. Her first child is due around the date of my wedding next year, but he's due this year. And so one of her last comments was, well, if it doesn't fall on my son's first birthday, I should be in attendance. Mm -hmm. And when I got that, I'm like, okay. <laughs> I I was very emotional and I was listening to Anna's podcast and I'm like, I'm going to write in for help because oh, I'm so I don't know how to approach this. Well, like just as a general idea, I really believe that weddings reveal, like people will show their hand because for some reason it feels loaded for most people. If someone is going to totally have your back and be like, hey, what do you need? Okay, this is going to be awesome. We're going to have the best time. Then that's a wonderful side to somebody. And then, of course, if somebody, a mother-in-law is like, I'm really mad that she's wearing a rose-colored dress and I <laughs> wanted to wear a rose or whatever, like yeah. that's also a revealing characteristic as well. But did you not have her a part of your wedding party because you naturally felt that she was either going to be a little bit dramatic or that you're like also kind of growing apart from her? Honestly, what I was trying to explain to her is that there was nothing negative about her or our friendship that led to my decision. It was solely based on, you know, I can't have everyone. You know, I have about 10 people because I've moved so much in my life. I have some close friends from different times of my life. And this is a new time of my life. And it doesn't mean she's not as much of a friend as she always has been. It just was a decision I had to make. And I chose my three childhood friends that I'm still very close to. And then my new sister-in-laws and my new stepdaughter. <laughs> so that's six people. And I thought it's my original family and my new family. And, and totally. That was it. That was my choice. Um, so yeah, you, what you brought up was what I was really worried about. And she took it that way. At least I felt yeah. that she took it that way. Um, and I don't quite know how to fully repair that. I do think that people take the wedding party as friendship ranking, which is tough. How much does she mean to you? I do think this is really repairable, but it might take a lot of time and effort, which you may not want to give. Yeah, I've been in the place where I have let friends go um, because the friendship was no longer conducive to my energy and where I want to go and, and what I'm doing in life. So I have been there with other people. I, I don't see that necessarily with me and her unless she chose that. Like it, it's almost like I'm I'm waiting to see is is this what she wants? <laughs> because if that's what she wants, I don't like how much can I fight? I wasn't trying to to like do anything, <laughs> you know, and it's just taking it right. that way. I, I guess what I would say is first of all, like if you said 
to me, David, I, I don't have room for you at the wedding. I would say, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I was hoping. Yeah. <laughs> Secondly, I think, you know, sometimes people reveal themselves in a certain way. And I mean, clearly, I don't know the ins and outs of weddings and invites. So I would downplay it. I mean, for me, it's like, oh, big, big fucking deal, you know, whatever, get over it. But obviously there's more to it than that. I can see just by the way you guys are taking it so seriously. So um, I think it's a lot of, it's a lot of you going, well, you know, this person is really revealing themselves to me. There's that. And then I was just thinking when you were telling the story, it was like, a wedding is a symbolic thing. It's real, yeah, but it's a symbolic thing. And this person is either going to be in your life or not. And what you're saying is you want this person in your life. She's an active friend. And, you know, like, forget about the symbolic thing. I know you're my friend. I rely on you for certain, you know, whatever. Like, let's continue that. I want you to be part of, you know, my marriage, my life, whatever, as I move forward. It just doesn't work for me to have you be part of the symbolic ceremony. And she's got to be able to handle it, I think. She's got to. I know this is the problem with ladies and weddings. <laughs> Clearly, I don't get David. it. Clearly, I'm, I'm not qualified to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true that like in the heightened tradition of weddings, people will run with their own narrative and have their feelings hurt by things that they practically shouldn't. But Melissa, I think it's interesting that you know her so well that you knew that she was going to react like this. How was your very last communication? Was it the text? Yeah, we were, well, we were texting. And then um, when I had written in, I cried almost every day, <laughs> like thinking about it because I wanted oh, to, I'm so so sorry. I, I wanted to reach out, but my fear was that she was going to take everything I said incorrectly, like the, a way that I, I don't intend. Yeah. And, um, Eventually, I felt like I exhausted all my options of asking people for advice. So I, I did write to her again. And, and um, you know, she, it, it was a couple weeks after and I needed to check on her, you know, family situation and her pregnancy. And, and I wanted her to know, you know, if you're not ready to talk to me, I understand, but I'm here for you. I'm her friend. I want her to know like she's She's very important to me. And, and as David was saying, you know, this is a symbolic thing that I honestly don't take it as serious either. Like I could have picked any number of people and I kind of went with logic in the moment. It wasn't about ranking anyone. It wasn't saying someone's not as important. And I've had many friends get married and not ask me to be in the wedding. I would never take that offense. I'm I'm happy to go party. Like, like that's fine. <laughs> I'm with you. I, I'm not used to dealing with that kind of response because I would never behave that way. Again, she has a lot going on in her life. So I started to try to empathize with that a little bit and avoid responding out of defense. You're doing an amazing job. I think persistence Melissa, because it does mean a lot that you've been emotionally upset about this. It would be something totally different if you were like, you know, we've been drifting apart for years. I'm not even sure if we have anything in common anymore. You know, that's a different story, but this person does matter to you. So I think persistence and continuing to show that to her, even if she comes back with immature, thoughtless, stinging responses, you know, I don't want you to look around at your wedding and, and be missing her. Yeah, I really want her there and I want her celebrating with us and I want it to be a fun time for her as well. I don't want her to be sad during it or leading up to it. One thing I was considering that I didn't bring up to her at the point of letting her know she wasn't in the wedding party is is maybe having her do a reading at the ceremony because we're not very religious or anything and my friendship with her over the years, we've done a lot of concert going. And so I thought maybe finding some song or lyric, something that is meaningful to me and Matt, but also to reflect my friendship with her and how much I've loved being with her. That's that's really sweet. Is there like a dinner before the wedding? Do people do that, right? <laughs> no. a dinner, right? It's called a rehearsal dinner, David. Yeah, there's supposedly a rehearsal dinner. Can you sit her at your table? Yeah, or like a toast at the reception afterwards. 
or like a reading or being an usher. But I think the groundwork of what she's choosing to absorb kind of has to be repaired before like the additional proposal. Yeah. I I think because it'll feel like, you know, she's an understudy or something. I'm trying to use language that David would understand. No, I I understand it. I just can't believe you're so mature and healthy. I'm just like, eh, just try to forget about it. Move on. (laughs) I would... If you have the financial resource to send her like a, you know, a $200 gift basket filled with, you know, whatever bath things or lotions, it's going to be like a month of sort of slightly gentle persistence. It's reassuring to hear what you're saying because, you know, there was time in between me writing in and asking for advice and kind of being in that emotional trenches of it and then me trying to work through it on my own. And I recognized. I just need to keep reaching out the normal friendship I've been having with her over the last two decades. And eventually I'll get to the point where things maybe will normalize a little bit. The emotions won't be as raw. And then when the timing is right and I have the right idea, and we're so early in planning that I don't even know what I want to ask her yet. So I need to give myself that time too. So I don't propose that in an ill-timed way. Anna can tell you how to get her accredited as a minister and she can do the marrying of you. Yes, I like that idea. There has to be some way of including her that will make her feel kind of special. Yeah. What means a lot, I think, is what you said, Melissa, about how upset you were and how like this has been painful for you. The idea that you caused her pain, which means she means a whole lot to you. And I would tell her, I would tell her like, Not just I never meant to hurt your feelings in any way, but this whole thing has also made me realize how much I love you and how important it is that you're there. I couldn't imagine you not being there. I want to be there for when you have your baby. I I think you just kind of continue to push that message with her because truly at first she won't hear it. She'll be like, if I meant so much to you, why am I not a bridesmaid? Yeah, and I was getting caught in this justification loop and everything I said was just not right. It, you know, everything just made her feel worse. And I'm like, just because I said I felt right, including my childhood friends, doesn't mean I feel wrong, including you. What I'm getting from you is you're not defensive or angry. And that's the beautiful thing. It's like, totally. you're just kind of there absorbing this. And I think it'll work out because you're not trying to justify your decision in any way. You're not angry at her for, I'd be angry, you know, and you're not angry. I think that's great. It's really, totally, really mature. And so I think ultimately she's going to read all that. She'll see it when she gets over her kind of panic that she's in right now. And then you'll be able to laugh about how you called the (laughs) podcast and talk to David Duchovny. Oh my goodness. (laughs) My fiance and I have been watching X-Files because we've never seen it before. So we're going through it for the first time. Uh And when I heard that you're going to be the guest, it blew my mind. (laughs) And my fiance did tell me to ask you to to officiate our wedding. (laughs) Yeah, I can't do that. (laughs) Let me just say that I will forgive you for never having watched it before. (laughs) Well, where, where, where are you getting married? We're in the Poconos in Pennsylvania. Oh, <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. And it's great that you have time to do this. Yeah. And I think she will be unresponsive at first and probably a little biting at first. And I think you just plow through it. I feel really good about your, your wedding, though. That's that's what I'm coming away with. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Me yeah. too. And later you'll be able to tell her, look, you know, this was sort of an excuse to have a large, wonderful party because she's clearly taking it as though you just established your best friends for life and she's not a part of it. So eventually she'll start to see how much she means to you. Yeah, it it does. It hurts me very deeply that I hurt her and um, I hope she knows that. It'll take a little persistence. Yeah. Because she's in, she may hurt your feelings. Just be prepared for those ideas. Yeah. <laughs> and continue to love her because she clearly means a lot to you. Yeah. But it will take like a month of being just like, I love you so much. Just Until all the she time. says, stop with the bath bubbles already. <laughs> I, I'm okay. I'm okay. 
tell Matt I think he's a lucky guy. The company oh, says he's a lucky you. guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Bye, Melissa. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. David, I know you have to go. Thank you again for all of your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for this. Okay. Bye, David. Bye. 